Our scripture reading is found today in 1 Corinthians 14, 7, and 8. Say amen when you get there, please. I heard a amen. That's good. Even things without life, whether flute or harp, when they make a sound, unless they make a distinction in sounds, how will it be known what is piped or played? For the trumpet makes an uncertain sound, who will prepare for battle? Good morning and happy Sabbath. Looks like spring is here, huh? Finally in Michigan. I hope you've been enjoying the beautiful days. So are we all ready for another study on the seven trumpets? I hope. Before we begin, let's have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, as we open thy word, we ask for your divine guidance. We're so weak, we're so helpless, we cannot understand unless you send us your Holy Spirit. Please illuminate our minds and purify our hearts through the truth contained in the message of the seven trumpets. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. In the Bible, the sound of the trumpet served as a vital communication line between God and his people. Different pitch or length or tone of the trumpet sound meant different things. And the people were required to recognize and know what each sound meant so that they could take appropriate action. Different uses of the trumpet sounds are described in the book of Numbers, chapter 10. You can take, I'll check this out later on. In Numbers 10, it was used sometimes to assemble the people together. Or sometimes it was used to signal different movements of the camps during their journey in the wilderness on their way to the promised land. And sometimes it was used for sanctuary services or ceremonies. And the most important use was as alarm, a war, a call to prepare for the battle. It was a very important and vital message of approaching enemy and destruction because people's lives were dependent on the correct sound of the trumpet and the correct action that must follow that sound. We've been hearing a lot of news about tornadoes and tsunamis in the past few weeks and months. But the sound of alarm in the Bible through the trumpet sound was like the tornado or tsunami warnings. It was extremely important to give the right sound. That's why Paul said in a scripture reading that Michelle read for us, Paul said if the trumpet gave an uncertain sound, who shall prepare for the battle? In other words, if the trumpet sound is not clear or distinct, how can anyone be ready for the battle? What kind of battle? Of course, it's a spiritual battle. Mankind is caught in the midst of the great controversy between Christ and Satan. And Bible tells us that this spiritual battle will become even more intense and more dangerous as we near the end until the final and decisive battle will be waged when every person living on this earth must choose sides between 
Christ or Satan? Between the seventh day Sabbath and Sunday, between the seal of God and mark of the beast. So the seven trumpet message in the book of Revelation, it's designed to prepare us for this last battle. But as Paul said, if the trumpets give an uncertain sound, we cannot be ready. Just imagine what would happen if a tornado or tsunami warning system fail to work properly. See, God has been faithfully blowing the seven trumpets loud and clear in the book of Revelation to awaken us from our spiritual sleep and to let us know that the final battle is very near. The enemy is approaching. The destruction is coming soon. But somehow, we have tampered with the warning system with different interpretations of the seven trumpets. Now, the sound is mixed, muffled, and even muted. So what happened in Adventism that changed the sound of the seven trumpets? That's what we're going to deal with first. And after that, we have a brief overview of the first four trumpets today. And then... In the last part, we're going to make applications from the past history to our day at the end of the time. That's the most important part of our study today. So let's deal with the first part. So what happened in Adventism? The interpretation of the seven trumpets that we're studying together is nothing new. It's based on the foundational teaching of Adventism beginning with our pioneers and what we as a church have been teaching for over 150 years. In other words, we were all united on the interpretation of the seven trumpets giving a loud, clear sound until about 20 to 25 years ago. Since then, the sound has been kind of mixed and muffled. Now, last week, in part one, we dealt a little bit with one form of false interpretation. It's called the futurist view. That's when you apply all seven trumpets and push it over to the future. After the close of probation and the second coming, they put all seven trumpets in the future. But there's another view introduced in Adventism in the 1980s. It's more dangerous and more subtle. But before that, I'd like to share one quotation from the Spirit of Prophecy. It's from Publishing Ministry, page 356. Publishing Ministry, page 356. And she's dealing with, she's talking about the book, Daniel and Revelation, written by Uriah Smith. Okay, I'm going to quote the grand instruction contained in Daniel and Revelation has been eagerly perused by many in Australia. This book has been the means of bringing many precious souls to a knowledge of the truth. Everything that can be done should be done to circulate Daniel and Revelation. I know of no other book that can take the place of this one. It is God's helping hand. Unquote. So the Spirit of Prophecy strongly recommended the book on Daniel and Revelation by Uriah Smith. And this Revelation seminar material published by Review and Herald back in 1983. They contain the same interpretation of the seven trumpets as the book by Uriah Smith. However, in 1985, a book titled God Cares 
by Mervyn Maxwell was published. Now, Mervyn Maxwell is a very well-known author and theologian in Adventism, and I have a high respect for him. I do use his books as my reference guide. And this is not about the messenger. This is about the message. In fact, Mervyn Maxwell has already passed away about 10 years ago. And his books contain a lot of truth. But with the truth, you have errors mixed. And errors are never harmless. Sometimes they grow and spread like cancer cells. And his interpretation of the seven trumpets and some other vital subjects are different from the foundational teaching of our church. And in volume two of his book, God Cares, page 232, Mervyn Maxwell admits that his view of the seven trumpet is not his original. He says he borrowed those teachings from Professor Edwin Thiele. He's another Adventist theologian. When Professor Thiele wrote a book, it, it's titled Outline Studies in Revelation, he gave some suggestions and proposals as possible interpretation. And Maxwell took those proposals and suggestions and made into his own teachings in his book. I'm going to share a couple of Mervyn Maxwell's interpretation, but before that, let's review what we learned last time. We spent a little time on the time prophecy of trumpet number six. That's from Revelation 9, verse 15. And the time period described in the Bible is an hour, a day, a month, and a year. And using the rule of prophetic time, remember what prophetic time is? One day is equal to one year. So if you add all these times together, you end up with 391 years and 15 days. And we saw last time that in the book, Great Controversy, page 335, we're clearly told that this time prophecy was fulfilled exactly on August 11, 1840, with the fall of Ottoman Empire. Now, this is a very important part of the foundation of Adventism. Why? Because this fulfillment as predicted by Josiah Litch at that time, it proved the prophetic principle of one day equals one year was correct. And as a result, we're told in the same passage in the book Great Controversy, it really empowered the message of the first angel's message during the Millerite movement as they preached that the end of 2300 day was soon to come. So this is a very important part of the foundation of our church. And this fulfillment has been confirmed by the spirit of prophecy. However, on page 259 of Maxwell's book, God Cares, Maxwell teaches that this prophecy was fulfilled around 1844, contrary to what the spirit of prophecy said. And also, instead of 391 years and 15 days, he just deals with 391 years. He just drops the 15 days altogether. But the Bible says an hour in a day, in a month, in a year. An hour in prophetic time is 15 days. So did the spirit of prophecy make a mistake? 
Are we going to try to improve on what is already given in the testimonies of Jesus? The Bible says an hour. We have to have that 15 days. I know theologians, they make all kinds of statements to prove their view. Maybe they might sound logical, but to me, why do we even have to question and create doubt in the spirit of prophecy and the Bible? So there's a deeper issue here than just the date or the interpretation of a prophecy. There's, there, there are more things in Mervyn Maxwell's book, but I'm just going to share one more thing. Same page, 259. According to Maxwell, trumpet number seven will not begin until just before the second coming. And he says that it would involve all literal events. It's kind of a mixture of the futurist view because they also say that they're all literal events. Now, according to our official foundational teaching, we learned last time when we met in part one that all six trumpets, the first six trumpets will fulfill were fulfilled before 1844. And we saw all the evidences from the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. And trumpet number seven has started to blow in 1844. After 1844, it has started to blow. It's still blowing now, and it will continue to blow until the second coming and beyond. However, according to Maxwell, Trumpet number six finished around 1844. And trumpet number seven doesn't start until just before the second coming. So we have no trumpet now. There's a big gap between the two. So we don't have any sound of the trumpet blowing. What about statements in the spirit of prophecy where she says, we are to give the trumpet a certain sound as we proclaim the three angels' message. No wonder the sound is muffled and muted. There is no sound of the trumpets in our church. See, what Professor Seely suggested had become Maxwell's teachings. And then they were adopted by many other theologians and pastors and evangelists and have become very popular interpretation of the seven trumpets. I hear it everywhere. Our only safety is to stay with the Bible and the spirit of prophecy and not follow other men's interpretation. We need to really stick with the Word of God. Now, we're going to cover brief overview of the first four trumpets. And next time we meet, in part three, we will cover the last three trumpets. And because of time limitation, I'm, I can only give you a very brief overview. For details, you can uh, refer to the book by Uriah Smith, Daniel and Revelation, or the Revelation seminar material. They have everything here in detail. Now, the first four trumpets portray the breakup of the original Roman Empire into ten European nations. If you know the prophecy in the book of Daniel, remember in chapter 7, there was that terrible-looking beast with ten horns? It's the same ten horns representing the ten European nations. So you see a connection between Daniel and Revelation. Also, the first four trumpets is a story of four different barbaric nations that 
carved up the Roman pagan empire and prepared the way for papacy to rise to power and rule the world for 1260 years during the Dark Ages. Now, trumpet number one, we see the Ostrogoths. In trumpet number two, we have Vandals. Trumpet number three, the Huns. And trumpet number four, the Herolites. Now, I don't know if you noticed, the four tribes that I, I just mentioned, the four tribes, out of the four tribes, three of them sounded familiar. The Herolites, the Vandals, and the Ostrogoths. They are the three horns that were plucked up by the roots by papacy, again in Daniel chapter 7. So you see another connection between Daniel and Revelation. Now let's open our Bibles now to Revelation 8. Revelation chapter 8, we're going to look quickly at those four trumpets. Let's begin with verse 7. Verse 7, where the first angel sounded. Now, do you see hail and fire and blood, all those symbols? Okay. Those hail, fire, and blood represent the savage attack upon Rome by the Ostrogoths. See, they came like a hailstorm with massacre and arson and cruel oppression. And do you see trees and grass burned up? Okay, they represent mass destruction of people. But why one-third? See, all four trumpets, the first four trumpets contain the word one-third. Also, trumpet number six contained the word one-third, but not in trumpet number seven. Now, one-third means partial measure or incompleteness. See, the Bible has many references to number three. The three persons of the Godhead, the three angels' message of Revelation 14. The three means complete. But one-third is incomplete. So the seven trumpets represent one-third or incomplete or partial destruction mixed with mercy. But we saw last time, last week, remember the seven last plagues? They do not contain any one third. That means it's a complete final destruction at the end. Seven trumpets and seven plagues, last plagues are two different events, two different prophecies. And historically, pagan Rome was divided into three parts, three territories after Emperor Constantine died. There are three territories with three capitals. Rome, Ravenna, and Constantinople. And at this time, only Rome was destroyed. That's why only one-third. Rome on the west side. So the first four trumpets, many people describe it as the fall of Western Rome because only one-third was affected. The fall of Eastern Rome did not occur until way later in the year 1453. Okay, let's look at trumpet number two in verses eight and nine. Do you see a great mountain burning with fire? This fiery mountain represents the vandals. You see the ships in those verses too, but the ships indicate that the power was a naval power. The Vandals were like pirates who controlled the Mediterranean Sea, and they brought much destruction to many coastal cities. That's why we have the word vandalism in English, right? It comes from Vandals. How about trumpet number three in verses 10 and 11? 
This time we see a great star from heaven burning. This flaming meteor represents Attila. He was the leader of the Huns. The star in the Bible represents top leaders. It could be a religious leader or a military leader. And then in those two verses, you see the wormwood. The name of the star was wormwood. Wormwood is a bitter herb. And they, that represents the cruel and heartless onslaughts brought by the Huns. And Attila's troops devastated and occupied Europe where there were many rivers. That's why there's a lot of reference to rivers and fountains of water in those verses. And meteor, meteors usually appear suddenly and they, they disappear suddenly too. So Attila and his troops came suddenly and disappeared fast in the history. So that was trumpet number three. Now trumpet number four is in verse 12. Here we see the sun and the moon and the stars. They represent the government leadership. Now the Herolites came and deposed the Roman emperor, Romulus, and abolished the government of Rome. The sun represents the emperors, the moon, the senators, and the stars, the consuls. And Rome surrendered in the year 476. That's the fall of Western Rome. And shortly after that, pagan Rome was divided into ten kingdoms. And out of the ten kingdoms, seven of the kingdoms gave military and economic support to papacy to uproot the three roots, the three horns. And then began the 1260 years of papal rule. So truth always is consistent with the truth of other parts of the Bible. But you might ask, so what? Very interesting history, but is there any relevance to our day? And the answer is yes. Now we're going to try to apply the principles from the past history to our day at the end of the world. We all know the story of Jericho in the book of Joshua, chapter 6. And if you recall in that story of Jericho, for six days, God's people marched around the city in silence following seven priests blowing the seven trumpets. Those strange activities, when if you, just imagine if you're living in the city of Jericho and you see a group of people just marching around once every day for six days. That was a warning message to those people of the coming judgment because the walls came crumbling down on the seventh day. And God's people had to conquer the city of Jericho before they could enter the promised land. Let's take that and apply to the end. God's people must also conquer a city, another city, before they can enter the heavenly Canaan. And what city is that at the end? The city of Babylon, the great Babylon in the book of Revelation. And just like the first six days was a warning, the first six trumpets that have already been fulfilled is a warning for what is going to take place during the blowing of trumpet number seven. When the great city of Babylon will fall. In other words, Jericho is a type of the fall of end time Babylon, end time Rome. Now we'll come back to the story of Jericho 
little later on at the end, so you have to kind of hold on to that thought. See, Jesus said, I am the Alpha and the Omega, beginning and the end. Jesus always uses the beginning to illustrate the end. Things that happened in the past history is written for our admonition at the end of the world. Now, the first four trumpets is a story of pagan Rome, and many people called pagan Rome as ancient Roman Empire. It was an empire. This story of ancient Roman Empire points to another story at the end. We know from the Bible that the main player at the end is papacy, the beast. But if you know the prophecy in Revelation 13, who is going to do all the dirty work for the beast? Who is going to do all the deceiving and forcing people to worship and control all the buying and selling? The image of the beast. And who is this image of the beast? The United States of America. So the story of ancient Roman Empire points to the story of end-time American Empire. Many secular historians and scholars have written books and papers comparing ancient Rome with modern America. Even our own pioneer, Eighteen Jones, has published a book called The Two Republics, comparing Rome and America. Also, there's another book written by Dr. Jim Black. He's not a Seventh-day Adventist, but he wrote a book called When Nations Die. Dr. Jim Black. When nations die, he gives a very interesting analysis of the downfall of great empires. When you compare ancient Roman Empire and end-time American Empire, there is one basic difference. Ancient Rome has pagan roots, but America has Christian roots. Probably that's the only difference. There are many similarities, though. Rome was a republic. United States is a republic. Rome was a superpower at that time. Political power, economic power, and military power. It's the same with the United States. It's a superpower. Rome had advances on education and technologies and sciences in those days. And it's the same with in the United States. That's a positive similarity, but on the negative side, history tells us that Rome's decline was very gradual. After reaching the pinnacle of its glory, wealth, and power, pride and arrogance and luxury began to infect the society from the inside. Crime, corruption, and violence filled the empire, and decay of the superpower started from within and began to spread little by little. And as political, economic, and military power began to wane, Emperor Constantine was baptized into Christian church in order to hold the empire together. And Constantine made a political move to win over both the pagan supporters and Christian supporters. And church and state came together and issued the first National Sunday Law in the year 321. And this is all clearly documented in the book Great Controversy. And after the National Sunday Law, God allowed judgments to fall and bring ruin through the four trumpets. 
using four bar barbaric nations as tools. Now the question is, do we see the United States following in the footsteps of Rome? Unfortunately, yes. Just ask any group of evangelical Christians in Sunday churches, and they will say something like, yes, we need to go back to God. This country is headed in the wrong direction. We must restore our God-given Christian values. When the Christian church united with the government in ancient Rome and changed the law of God by issuing a National Sunday Law, they committed an apostasy and turned against God. And after that apostasy, the ruin followed. And this is a biblical principle. National apostasy followed by national ruin. And this principle in the history of ancient Roman Empire will be repeated by the end time American Empire. Let's turn our Bibles to the book of Isaiah because that's where we find this principle. Isaiah 27. Isaiah chapter 27, verses 3. Four and five. I'm sorry, this is Isaiah 24. We will go to 27 later. Isaiah 24, verses 3 to 5. The Bible says, The land shall be utterly emptied and utterly spoiled, for the Lord has spoken this word. The earth mourneth and fadeth away, the world languishes and fadeth away. The haughty people of the earth do language. The earth also is defiled under the inhabitants thereof because they have transgressed the laws, changed the ordinance, broken the everlasting covenant. National apostasy followed by national ruin. To change the law ordained by the universe, the king of universe, is the highest treason against God and his government. In fact, in a spirit of prophecy, she uses this sentence, national apostasy followed by national ruin at least five times. You can read that in the book Last Day Events pages 133 to 134, and she always refers to the United States when she says national apostasy will be followed by national ruin. That is the central message of the first four trumpets, national apostasy followed by national ruin. That's the central theme of the first four trumpets, and that's the warning message to the most powerful nation on earth. Its ruin will be followed by its apostasy. But actually, the first four trumpets, the message is designed especially for us as God's people, as Seventh-day Adventists. Because God says, he cries out, cry aloud, spare not. Lift up thy voice like a trumpet and show my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sins. That's from Isaiah 58. Please, later on, you can read the whole chapter in Isaiah 58 because God says to cry aloud, to lift our voice like a trumpet. God wants to show us our sins, our transgressions, in fact, the spirit of prophecy says that this whole chapter of Isaiah 58 is applying to those who are living in the last days. And I'm going to read from Bible Commentary, Volume 4, page 1149, 4 BC, 1149. It says, our work now is to rouse the people. 
The message must not be muffled with smooth words or fair speeches, crying peace, peace when there is no peace. To those who are turning away from God, well, we're not turning away from God, are we? We're keeping the commandments. We're keeping the right day of the week, the Sabbath. We're paying our tithes, and we're doing all the wonderful works in the church. However, we're told in the same passage, we are guilty of the same sins as ancient Israel. A lot of outward show, a lot of high profession, but we lack the true humility and sincere repentance. She says that the worldly policy has been allowed to come in into our church, into our homes, into our lives. Because that's what happened to Christians during the time of ancient Rome. We're told in a book, Great Controversy, uh, page 50, the nominal conversion of Constantine caused great rejoicing. And the world cloaked with a form of righteousness walked into the church. That's what happened during the time of ancient Rome. I'm going to share one more quotation. This is from Adventist Home, page 500. It says, the popular amusements such as Football and boxing have the same characteristics as did the games of ancient Rome. Remember the gladiators who killed each other? And Christians being eaten by lions? The people in those days called that entertainment. But ancient amphitheaters have come in into our homes, into our lives, through TV and internet and high-tech games and DVDs and iPads and iPhones, you name it. Violence, corruption, adultery, crime. We call them entertainment. The worldly elements, including those amusements or music or food, see, they are very stimulating. They are so exciting, so fun. It's hard to compete with Bible studies or Sabbath school lessons or history or prophecies. I know I used to think that way. Oh, it's just so boring to study history and prophecies. But now, it's the other way around. It's so exciting to study the history and the prophecies. But the question is, What are we putting into our minds every day? Because the great controversy is a battle of the mind. Are we going to have the mind of Jesus or are we going to have the mind of the enemy? But the beauty of the gospel is is that when we come near to Jesus, and spend time in his word because the word is like opening into the mind of God. The more we spend time in the word of God, our minds are going to become more and more like Jesus. And our desires for worldliness will disappear one by one. And Jesus gives us new desires, new motives, and new impulses. And we just praise God for the promise that he can recreate us in his image. Now, for our last scripture, let's turn to Isaiah 27, just a few pages over, to Isaiah chapter 27, verse 13. Before we read that verse, Let's just for a minute go back to the story of Jericho. On the seventh day, after the people 
marched around the city seven times, following the seven priests blowing the seven trumpets. What did the people do? People shouted with a great shout, and then the walls came crumbling down, right? In the same way, during the time of trumpet number seven, which has been blowing since 1844, it's still blowing now, and after the National Sunday Law is passed, it's going to swell into a loud cry. And remember Rahab, the harlot? She and her family, they were saved from the city of Jericho. In that same way, many people will hear that loud cry message and will come out of Babylon, the great harlot, and be saved. And that same event is described right here in Isaiah 27, verse 13. The Bible says, And it shall come to pass in that day that the great trumpet shall be blown, and they shall come which were ready to perish in the land of Assyria and the outcasts in the land of Egypt and shall worship the Lord in the holy mount at Jerusalem. Praise the Lord, many people out there, the Gentiles who have never heard the message before, will hear and come. Take hold of the truth, and they will become part of the holy mountain, that church triumphant, that will welcome Jesus. The question we need to ask ourselves, are we really ready to give the message of the great trumpet? The loud cry message after the National Sunday Law. Or are we going to run away and hide like the disciples, because we're afraid. Or because we can't even give the message because we've never really studied and understood for ourselves. Before we close, I'm going to share one more similarity between ancient Roman Empire and end-time American Empire because this is very, very important. Who was born in the midst of of ancient Roman Empire. Jesus Christ was born in the midst of ancient Roman Empire. He lived there for 33 and a half years. He went on a public ministry for three and a half years and preached the gospel. He was crucified by Roman soldiers. Let's look at the end time American Empire. Who or what was born in the midst of America? The Great Religious Awakening. Prophetic movement was born in America. Let's go back to Rome, ancient Rome. After Jesus was crucified, he resurrected, went to heaven. In the time of Pentecost, the disciples began to preach the gospel. And the gospel went to all the world at that time in America the everlasting gospel the same gospel had been preached all over the world Christian church was born in the midst of ancient Roman Empire remnant church was born in end time American Empire there were living prophets in ancient Rome like Peter and John and Paul. In fact, Apostle Paul preached to Emperor Nero. Everybody had a chance to hear the gospel in ancient Roman Empire. How about American Empire? We had a living prophet, Ellen G. White. Her writings are still alive today. You see, how blessed we are here in America. And God judges based on how much light and opportunities we have received. And all the blessings comes with that responsibilities and accountability. We have no excuse. 
And God never forces anything on anyone. We all have a choice to choose what to believe, what we want to believe. If you have never lived in a foreign country, you don't know what a blessing to have the Spirit of Prophecy writings in English. We have so much light, so much treasure available to us in this country. That is why we're going to come back in two weeks and study a little bit more about this end time American empire because in part three, we're going to learn. You see, a little bit more about God's judgment. See, in Trumpets 1 through 4, God allowed satanic power of barbaric nations to fall on ancient Roman Empire as his judgment because of their apostasy. And God will again allow satanic power of Islamic extremists to fall on end-time American empire to bring ruin and destruction. Yes, there are many sincere Muslims who will hear the gospel and be saved. And that's a different subject. But we're going to learn next time what the Bible says about Islam. Not what man says, but what God says about Islam, because that is the most important thing. The sound of the seven trumpets in the book of Revelation is God's desperate and urgent call. His heart full of love and mercy because we're facing a very dangerous situation right ahead of us. His, his message is to run, to run into the safety of his arms. See, when tsunami warning blasted throughout the southeast Japan two months ago, many people recognized that sound and heeded that warning. They took immediate action. They dropped everything and ran up the hill. And from the top, they could see huge waves coming ashore, destroying everything in its path. And they're all shouting and screaming. We could hear them when we watched the news because they saw some friends and neighbors and families still trying to come up the hill. And they're crying, come on, run, run, hurry, hurry, run. But many did not make it in time. And that's the message of the seven trumpets. God is calling us, shouting, come on, wake up, run, hurry, just drop everything, all the weight of sin and all the worldliness, and come run, run to Jesus, hold on to Jesus, because he is the only one that can save us. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the message contained in the seven trumpets. Please help us to open our spiritual eyes and see the danger ahead of us. Thank you for the seeds of truth that were planted in our minds and hearts today. Help us to guard those truths as we walk out of this place and give us true repentance and true revival in our hearts so that we can be ready, so that we can be prepared to give that final message of your love to all the people in the world before you come. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.